short if you would, please. In other words, a question, not a speech. Um, hello, my name is Peter Kerr. I live at Mount Druitt in Western Sydney. And I listen to Alan Jones all the time on 2GB. And Alan's always talking about water in Australia, watering Australia. I'd like to build dams in the high rainfall areas, the Grafton, the north coast, uh, Fitzroy River, all around the wet areas, have big pipe, big dams, and have pipelines going across Australia to the drought and in the inland New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia, Western Australia. And, and what's your and question, grow Peter? Food and crops and all that. And, and, and your question? do the same in other countries. Yeah. That, the government's doing no, spending no money on this watering business. Peter, just, ju Peter, just very quickly, sorry to interrupt you. Just what is the question, though? Well, um, I, I don't believe in... I'm on Mr Monk, Monkford's um, side Monk, about yeah. no... I'm not in... Uh, the climate's not changing and all that. We've got to harvest water all okay. over the world. Well, so I don't know whether he would feel inclined to answer the question, but... Yes, uh, right. Uh, the question um, is about... Did we yeah. desalinate and spend billions, which is bottled electricity... Um, why wouldn't we just harvest that which falls? Right. Uh, it, it always makes sense to make use of what the good Lord provides. And if you can put in dams in areas without doing too much environmental damage in those areas, and that is often possible. You've got a very large continent here. Putting in a few dams is not going to do that much environmental harm, frankly. Putting in pipelines, if you bury them and landscape them, you'd never know they were even there, and they're not going to hurt any of the creatures around about. So all of that can be done. Because the point you're making, Peter, and it's a perfectly sensible one, is that water shortage here and elsewhere in the world, which is a growing problem, though not, I have to say, in Scotland, <laughs> is, uh, is a simple engineering problem on a large scale. With goodwill and with careful environmental management and design, then you can take a number of approaches to harvesting water. One thing I can tell you, after my researches into the Australian climate is that there has in fact been no trend, upwards or downwards, in rainfall in Australia across the whole of the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. So even though some areas will have experienced drought, overall the rainfall pattern is more or less as it always has yeah. been. And so yes, if you husband those resources, this is after all, broadly speaking, a desert climate, you need to husband your water resources very carefully, a certain amount of money diverted away from all this UN fancy pants nonsense and towards making sure that the Australian people have enough water to live on and grow their crops on makes eminent good sense and I congratulate you, sir. The, the, the gentleman up the back there. Yes, thank you. Thank you. The gentleman up there. No, right at the back. We're being geographically fair here. Uh, yes. Just a question to both gentlemen. There, there seems to be a, well, I'll call it a myth anyway, that the planet is fragile. Um, I've seen some sort of articles about that. W w one in particular was a book called Reading the Rocks. I've forgotten the name of the scientist, but I'm sure that um, probably you gentlemen might know. I think it was a Scandinavian female geologist, which leads me to believe that the, the planet is actually not that fragile. Um, would either of you care to comment on that, on that piece of sort of myth, I suppose? That, that, that the geologist out? will do that, I hope. We've had, we've had five major mass extinctions of life from which we have recovered and life has taken off after those mass extinctions. Every time a species shuffles off, there is a new ecology created for another species. The second thing is that two of the six major ice ages were at the equator and at sea level. The planet was a snowball. We recovered. This planet is incredibly resilient. It is dynamic. We have been hit by things out there many, many times. We have had pandemics right through life and this planet keeps ticking. And the reason why the planet keeps ticking is we have constant recycling of material on planet Earth. And the difference between this planet and all other planets in our solar system and possibly others is that we have the one ingredient to make this planet dynamic and to have life and it's called water. Well done, Peter. That over there, yes. Just over here on my, on my left, yes. The, the person with the hand up. Thanks. How do you think we should respond to the, uh, the schools or the governments? 
when our children are forced to answer uh, that CO2 is changing climate? Yes, it's a very good question, yeah. In fact, I had a, a heart-rending email from one of those in the audience here today, just last night, talking exactly about that problem, that children are being propagandized in the classroom, brainwashed in the classroom. They are being told that this is a problem caused by their parents. They are being set against their parents by half-witted, half-educated teachers whose motive is malicious. And somebody is saying, Cain the teachers. And it's very difficult to know how to deal with this. Yeah. I mean, that was the ground on which we were able to attack Al Gore's horrible movie in the High Court in London in 2007. Because the British government was going to buy, at full price of $20 a whack, 5,000 of these horrible movies, and it was going to send one to every school in England, which was then going to show it to every class several times. Now, we put a stop to that, by hauling the government up into court. And the judge said, is there a law by which they can't propagandise people? And we said, yes, my lord, there is. It's the Education Act, 1996. And he said, 1986, I should say. And he said, uh, and what does this act say? And, I, and so we said, well, it says that they aren't allowed to do propaganda on political grounds in the classroom. And how do we know what this law means? Well, sir, I said... I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes, this gentleman here, just in the front. Thank you, yes. Yes, sir, you. We need a the gentleman just here. Or we just get a microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good evening. Look, I had a talk with someone uh, this evening before I came here. And um, she was babbling on about the ozone layer, and I reminded her, she's younger than me, that in the 60s or 70s, the US and Russia were detonating atmospheric nuclear bombs over the Pacific. And the ozone layer, somehow or other, for the last 30 years, hasn't seemed to suffer, but she was, again, just out of the school system, and as far as she's concerned, the o ozone layer was damaged irreparably. Now, I hope my answer to her... Uh, was the right answer because uh, that's all I could think of at the time that, you know, if it hasn't been damaged by a nuclear bomb testing going on, well, why is she so concerned about this ozone layer? And, and it's, it's, is that still an issue that the people who are saying that climate change is happening, uh, is that one of the issues that is still floating around or, or they really drop that now? Right, that's a very good question. The ozone layer, I should explain, is up in the stratosphere. It's above the kind of climate-relevant part of the atmosphere. And it's a very, very thin, probably only a few atoms thick, layer of a particular form of oxygen that has three oxygen atoms bound together. And that can very easily be disrupted by certain chemicals, such as, uh, and they're called chlorofluorocarbons, which, if they interact with these molecules, can break them apart into a two-atom oxygen molecule and a single atom of oxygen. So that's what the worry about the ozone layer was, because the most energetic part of the sunlight that comes down from above is in the ultraviolet, and that tiny little kind of umbrella of ozone over us is one of the most effective ways of making that not too much, making sure that not too much of that um, very energetic ultraviolet light that can cause cancers and cause all sorts of other problems down here gets through. So that was what the fuss was all about. And by the Mo Montreal Protocol, which was one of the first sort of global environmental actions ever taken, these chlorofluorocarbons were banned and the ozone layer has been slowly repairing itself since, but far more slowly than they thought. And the reason why is twofold. First of all, we haven't been observing the ozone layer for more than about 60 years. So we don't really know how it waxes and wanes. We didn't even know it was there, until the hole in the ozone layer, until about 60 years ago. 
So we don't have enough records to really understand